We invite your questions for our speaker. Questions of challenges, requests for elaboration, disagreements, examples. Yes. Um, very interesting talk. I teach a little stuff. Thanks. Um, yes, do identify yourself because you're being videotaped. Oh, wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, my name is Nick Tampio. I teach and it's surveyed. And surveyed. <laughs> <laughs> the, I read a little scan coming. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, no, uh, my name is Nick Tampio. I teach political theory at Fordham, and I found this talk really interesting. And um, I guess the question, I, I had two questions, but I'll just start with one later. Maybe I'll come back to the other one. Um, so when you're, using the, when you're engaging this literature, if you use the exact same words, then then you're not criticizing them. But if you go too far askant, then they're not going to understand you. So we always have a choice about how far to go from the subjects of the inquiry, uh, the critique. And sometimes I felt like, like I was reading your Millennium article on the way down and then listening to your talk. It seemed like you were hovering really close to the object of critique. And I was kind of wondering, why didn't you go farther a little bit? Like you were just using too many of the terms. Like, in this, art, in this article, too many of the terms of like Habermasian and critical theory. So pretty much all the same words, but add a little care, but stay really within a sort of a rationalistic, cool, hard language. And, um, and so just for example, like when you talk about the, uh, feminist care theory and security theory as being critical of challenging existing hierarchy, well, critical of existing hierarchy, that's like using a sword. And like, I mean, is there any way you could like talk about like defending or protecting relationships of care. So all of a sudden, it's 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 assuming a more. Maybe I'll stop there. No, no, no. It's not. I'm, I'm trying just to take it all in. Um, um, yeah, I mean that's a kind of different paper, but but I guess you're saying you heard the same kinds of things uh, coming. Oh, yeah, when you criticize these challenging hierarchies, well, I think that's important. Yeah. But I think it's also. Um, yeah. You know. I don't know, it's protecting communities, protecting love. Like, yeah. is, love, is love a concept that we should bring into IR theory? Maybe. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, 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 I guess I'm, I'm, I, I am a little reluctant um, because uh, to start using that language because it tends to be interpreted um, that when you, as, oh, you're bringing, bringing in the ethics of care to IR, that means we just have to like, love each other more. We just have to care more about each other. And, and, and I think it's really not that. Because I, 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 I'm not sure that that's, go ahead. Quick follow-up. So when you say that we need to make sure that you know, uh, equitable distribution of care, that men need to do their parts too. So when I hear that, I'm thinking, oh gosh, that seems to be suggesting that care is this like, dirty, hard, yucky work, and it seems like it's much more interesting to say, like, ontologically it's always there, and ethically we should appreciate it more and not stigmatize it. But if you say that, you know, if you make the focus that men are doing their share, then it's going to, you know, in the way it's playing into the hands mm -hmm. of, of maybe more traditional IR theory. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, although I am really reluctant to... Uh, uh, I I'm critical of the kind of finger pointing at men. You know, even the World Bank has tried to do this in some countries and said, "Okay, you men, you have to learn how to be a better man and start caring more." And I, I'm not trying to say that about individual men don't care, but that the, the concept of care is just gender is a gendered concept, and I think that that gendering contributes to its devaluation. So, so I, I know what you mean. It all sounds kind of negative, I think, is what you're saying. And that it could, it could be much more positive. Is that what you're saying? It, it could be a more positive thing we could talk about. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't want to think up all the time, but I mean, I'm thinking about yeah. somebody like Martha Nussbaum, who starts Sex and Social Justice by talking about these stories of, of women who are being oppressed. And so she's just, she's got to start with the narrative and, and say, you know, she writes books and upheavals of thought and says, you know, affect is part of thinking. Yeah. And, and, you know, I read this article, and so this is my sample size. Um, and it, there was just no affect. There was no poetic language. It was just the straight IR theory. And I said, gosh, couldn't, couldn't we try a different style? Yeah. You know, it's not just the substance, but it's also like a different style that just says that, like, let's not, let's not be scared of these yeah. 
Okay. So you're going to give a paper on that next, <laughs> right? No, I'm really style. interested in what you're saying, and, I, and I, I, one does find that in, in IR theory, increasingly among the kind of decolonial theorists um, writing in the kind of poetic mood. That's kind of sort of came to our mind things I've read recently, um, as opposed to feminists, which is interesting. Um, so. I don't really have an answer to your question, no, I guess, okay. but I'm very interested in, 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 in the comment. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Please identify yourself if you don't mind. Well, my name is Maria Ortiz. And um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that uh, overall, I mean, it's good to think about it, politics of fear in a kind of a personal level, but we have been doing that for years. I mean, religion. In all religions, there is an element of caring. In Christian religion, you care for, uh, love one another, you love your neighbor as yourself, you know, all these things. And I guess what I, the drift that I was getting in terms of your presentation was maybe more institutional. <laughs> I was thinking in an institutional level, you know, like a caring that is translated to a level that is higher than just a personal level, but a more broader, um, I don't know if we could say national or, uh, I mean, ideally that's what comes to my mind, but then the problem is how do you, I don't know if that was your intention, but what I was thinking was in terms of that kind of level, like a wider level, like, yeah, I I, I, but, but then the problem is how do you integrate that into like, a capitalist system? where you're supposed to fend for yourself, and so, I mean, and that is the struggle, and that, uh, and that is the, I mean, that is the struggle, I mean, how do you integrate that to make it possible and make it real, you know? Yeah, and I think maybe, maybe I have become more pessimistic over the years, or I don't know, but I, I, I know what, what you're saying about taking care, yeah, because you're right, feminists have been talking about care, um, existing at, 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 a, at a, a kind of a personal level, um, and it would seem that if you're going to globalize care, you're going to take it up to an institutional level. You know, we should care about people across borders, or we should have institutions that do that, or even state should care about our state. But I think the point I'm trying to make is not that a state is going to care about another state, because I think once you start arguing that, you can't take away from what care ethics is actually about. It is about, you know, as Virginia puts it, the, the responsibility to deal with, to, to address the needs of particular others. So I do think we can look, up, look at it in a global perspective by actually looking at different arrangements of care in different societies and thinking about the way that uh, uh, the global political economy or global social policy, what, how does that work to support or not relations of care. And for human security, I think that, you know, it's not, if you, if you try to imagine someone living in a state of human insecurity, again, they don't, they don't live that insecurity in isolation. They live it in families uh, and in communities. Um, and there are gender relations and relations of ethnicity and which are all interwoven. So my point was not to just say, let's take care up to a higher level, scale, that kind of level, but rather to say, let's look at the way people experience security or insecurity, and let's think about it from, the, from a perspective of a care ethics, as opposed to, say, a justice ethics or a, a traditional understanding of, of human rights, rights-based ethics. Does that make sense? Uh. Well, I guess I could jump in in defense of economic human rights because I think that I, I don't, I think you need both, uh, both the human rights and the a greater emphasis on care and empathy also in relation to realizing them and in terms of even, uh, the way you're talking about it. But an uh, economic right um, to means of subsistence and right to education and right to health or healthcare, um, all would lead, would be important elements if they were institutionalized uh, of, of a human security approach more broadly. So I'm not sure about that I was ever fully convinced by the 
and Tinley that you um, propose in many of your articles, which is very effectively, you know, uh, worked out. But it, it it seems to me that one needs to add the care dimension and also transform the understanding of human rights, but not just reject them. Well, I think that when the way that you write about human rights is a, is a lot different from the way that yeah, some true. people, and it's I'm really not you um, or others, I you know, uh, I think of uh, Jennifer Nadalski who's written about yeah. relational autonomy and, and rethinking rights, and, and, and uh, so it's, I'm, I'm, you know, the way you have rethought rights is very convincing to me. So I, I think, and I've tried to always say that it's kind of standard kind of um, liberal understandings of rights, which are very individualistic. And I think, again, I really do see it on a very conceptual level. So it's not to necessarily say that rights aren't important, but rather to say that people achieve their rights through relations of care, um, and that you can't ignore them if you want to. Sure, we all want the same things at the end, right? And I guess it's a question of what kinds of discourses and what kind of focus is going to be most effective to achieve well-being for people. And sometimes I worry that, although I sound like I'm making the same argument that the guys made about human security, but sometimes I worry about the, the idea of rights is so, so steeped in uh, and, and used as a kind of justificatory rhetoric for other kinds of liberal reforms to do with economic reforms and okay. that kind of thing. Any of the students? We have all these talented students here. Yeah. Speak up. Carissa. <laughs> Hi, thank you for your talk. My name is Carissa. I'm a PhD student here at the Kinney Graduate Center. So I wanted to ask you if you could maybe share with us some uh, vivid example uh, so imagine a recommendation from the UN or the, or the World Bank that has this like liberal, individualized idea about human rights, and how would that differ um, from your proposal, where you look at um, through a lens of care? Like, what, what would be the contrast? Well, uh, again, I can't, I can't think of it in terms of specific policies, but again, I think that the focus would have to be on thinking about. In, in conditions of insecurity, looking at what kinds of relations and networks of care have, are in crisis or have broken down, um, whether it's a, a kind of an acute crisis, like an acute uh, violent conflict or an environmental disaster, um, or, or a more long-term crisis like poverty, right, which affects. So how, what kinds of, how does, do uh, families, communities, uh, and indeed the entire nation state organize care, um, you know, how can we make sure that adequate care is, is, exists for, uh, for families, communities, that might, uh, we might think about time to care, um, whether it's health care, child care, care for the chronically ill. Um, so it would be to recognize the need to, to bolster those aspects uh, of, of life to think about not just an individual and oh what can we do to make sure that individual individual is exercising his right to an education for example um, but again as I was just saying to try and achieve that, that right by thinking about what how, what kinds of relational uh, uh, context can be can be strengthened um, you know and I think this is true not only not just at the global context but in the context of you know, most societies. Um, I'm actually writing a kind of policy paper now in Canada for a, a policy a group, um, a sort of think tank, um, and the, the, the project is called Faces of Aging. And when they first asked me to do that, I said, well, I can't do that because I don't do the policy. I'm a theorist. And they, she said, no, no, that's, that's what we want. We want you to tell us how we need to think differently about the care. Uh, so again, challenging the kind of notions of um, autonomy, that this is the number one concern for people, um, but rather to say that, that to, to, to think of yourself as dependent and vulnerable is not a bad thing. It's not something that needs to be squashed, but rather we need to recognize that we are all dependent and vulnerable and that we need to um, put in place uh, networks and, and safety nets to, um, to ensure security in the face of that inevitable 
dependency and vulnerability. Okay? Yeah. Okay. First Brandon and then Hi, I'm, I'm Brandon, a third year student in political science here at the Graduate Center. Um, hopefully this works out into a question because it's just been sort of a series of commentaries in my mind. So it seems to me that, you know, part and parcel of this um, ethics of care is, is recognition. Um, and as someone who is per particularly interested in transgender and transsexual issues, what worries me is that if we don't have a kind of a system of understanding recognition um, as what constitutes a woman, um, what constitutes gender, right? If, if we go through the realm of suggesting that gender or sex is purely biological, um, then we seem to fail to understand how <coughs> perhaps we ought to care for a transgender individual. And I, for instance, use um, this as a, as a, a Example uh, recently in Argentina, right, their, their uh, passage of a law that does not require medical intervention to have just their uh, gender check box on official documents, right, um, is a system of recognition um, for individuals who are who have sort of non-normative bodies. So I wonder how does that enter into the picture? Is it a part of that project? This um, sort of human security and ethics of care. How do how do trans individuals fit within that scope? Well, that's a great. That's a great question. Um, what I certainly didn't want to do, you know, and it's a big kind of debate in care ethics, is to to essentialize um, or to see gender as something biological. Um, and so, if the, 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 I certainly didn't want to do that. Although I admit that explicitly, I haven't recognized uh, transgendered individuals or um, how that might. Um, affect care ethics, although I do have to write a paper on care ethics and recognition, and I don't really know what I'm going to write, so now there's one thing that, there that I am going to write uh, that has got me thinking. Um, so, so, I think that, um, I think that my concern for um, uh, thinking about masculinity and femininity rather than men and women, and I try to make that explicit in, in the book and in other writings, um, again, is to demonstrate that I don't see gender as a biological thing, but something that is constructed. And that care is gendered feminine, which is in itself an essentializing act, but that's part of what I want to unpack and, and criticize. And then why, it, why are hegemonic forms of masculinity or hegemonic understandings of what is masculine so contra care, or care is not seen to be a part of, of, of that dominant understanding of what masculinity is. So, I think there would be, I think I could bring in your, what you're saying um, into my understanding of why care is not valued, um, I think. Although I, I still am working with conceptions of what is masculine and what is feminine. Um, but I, again, I think also my my idea, my idea, but the idea that that all human beings are vulnerable and dependent, um, and therefore need care, but also that giving care is an important part of the lives of all human beings, um, could you know would, would would be responsive to what you're saying. Unless you, so, I don't have anything more to say about that. But if you do, happy, we'll happy talk to you later. later. Maybe yeah. after. Thank you. Go to hear from our students and faculty are allowed also to speak again and visitors and lawyers. There's so many different I'll try and be more of these. Um, my name is Phoebe. Thanks for your talk. That was great. I think it's really valuable. Um, I was kind of interested in how you said you want to make an ontological claim, but not a normative one, but then a normative one kind of falls out of it. I wondered if you could expand on that and kind of say what motivated you to yeah. make that decision. Sure. I can tell you exactly. Um, so I, uh, as Carol said, I wrote the book in 1999, Globalizing Care, and uh, my friend and colleague at the London School of Economics, Kim Hutchings, uh, wrote an article which was very sympathetic and very nice, but she did say that she found in the book a kind of flip-flopping tendency that I had 
between wanting care to be critical and wanting care, wanting to say that care is good, we should care, we should care more, it's really good. <laughs> you know, so I'm making a normative claim. And, and, and when I reflected upon that, I thought, yeah, I think I, I do do that. Uh, I recently wrote a, an article about um, that relied on Sarah Ruddick's work, and, and I was rereading passages in her, in her book, Maternal Thinking, where she discusses this tension as well, right? That her wanting to not um, necessarily take a kind of foundational, moral epistemological stance, and yet kind of finding herself doing so at the same time. So. So since I wrote that book, I have tried to think about, uh, again, t taking some, take, reading Kim's work has helped me um, in this regard, thinking about care as something that we do rather than something that we ought to do. So at least taking that as my primary uh, reference point. In other words, that what care ethics can do is reveal the care that's there but hidden. And I think it is hidden due to our kind of dominant lenses that we have when we look at ourselves, especially in, in liberal democracies. We think of ourselves as all a bunch of little individuals. We each us drive in our cars. And, but, but that effaces the networks of care and responsibility that, that are hidden because they're in the so-called private sphere, right? And that public-private dichotomy is also part of liberalism as well. So, um, so I, I like to think of care as, as a critical theory that reveals these kind, reveals care and gets us to start to think about it, right? And, and, and reveals the inequities and the, 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 the hierarchies and the uneven distributions of, of labor and, uh, in, in that context. And so, and when I said I don't think it's completely non-normative, I think I think there are, you know, it starts to make you think about a better possible world. But but I try not to say that I'm relying on some kind of firm epistemological ground to be able to make those claims. Yeah, that's good. Do you want to follow? Up? Um, well, one quick one. Like, would you want to say? I know you don't want to say any of this, but would you want to say like? <laughs> all care is good generally, or would you lean towards like there can be bad caring and good caring, like all of this becomes revealed yeah. through this critical. Exactly, and when I said all care is good, that was that was wrong. I mean, good caring is good, right? <laughs> yeah, so then that's a good point. And, and that's another you know, point that you hear from critics of care ethics who say, well, you know, mothers can kill their babies, and you know, it, why, what are you, why is this necessary? necessarily so good. So yeah, I, I, I hope that that more critical epistemological approach can, can, yeah, can open our eyes to the way that care can be, you know, good or... I hate or to do this, but how no. do you tell the difference between a good care and a not good care? Yeah, no, no, that's a good question. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a, I need, I should have a quick answer to that question. There's only two ways. It's either outcome based or in the eyes of the recipient. Virginia wants to answer. Okay. Let's <laughs> from Virginia. Um, well, this, Virginia this, question, yeah. this question is very much related to the last one. But when you say that you're more interested in the ontological claims than in something like um, the ethics of care as a moral theory, um, don't you think that the ontological claims that you're rejecting are very much built into um, something like Kantian theory and utilitarianism. I mean, can you escape having to think of the ethics of care as a different kind of moral theory because um, those ontological yeah. claims that you're looking yeah. to make seem uh, to require it. Yeah. No, I I think you're right. I think that, uh, um, yeah, even when you start to talk about people as relational rather than as individual moral subjects or rational moral subjects, you're already making a different theory. Um, and uh, so maybe I'm trying to separate too much 
ontology and epistemology that they they can't really be separated in that way. Um, I guess I guess my 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 what I was trying to do overwhelmingly was to say there there is no there's no kind of strong firm foundation upon which we can make judgments. I guess about what is morally right and morally wrong, um, but we can look at contextually. Uh, we can look in, at different contexts and make judgments about what might be better or worse in different. Yes, Joanna. Hi, my name is Joanna. I'm also a PhD student uh, in the philosophy department. Um, and I was hoping that you could say maybe a little bit more about um, intervention. So when we think about security issues, global security issues, uh, often what we think about is what, whether you know, interventions are justified and how we should intervene. Um, and I was thinking about that in terms of, of what you were saying about the relationship between agency, vulnerability, and care. Uh, so it seems that you were trying to bring out that vulnerability is not necessarily gendered. We're all vulnerable, and we all have these sort of relational um, groups that we belong in. Um, and part of what a care ethics should do, maybe, is uh, bolster the agency of of members of groups that are in these sort of vulnerable positions vis-a-vis -vis one another. Um, so agency and vulnerability seem to go hand in hand here. Um, but I'm wondering, from a humanitarian interventionist view, what would it mean to intervene in a way that could bolster agency while also kind of speaking to the intrinsic vulnerability that we all have? And if you could maybe bring out a little bit more about that issue. Yeah. That's a really good question, and again, I, I don't I don't really have an easy answer to that. Although I have thought about the question of humanitarian intervention quite carefully, um, and a lot of the literature, the kind of uh, international political theory literature that addresses moral questions related to humanitarian intervention, tries to come up with a kind of calculus or a, a kind of formula for when intervention is required. Um, I, I'm kind of hesitant to do that because I think there's a there's a there's a tendency to focus on the kind of moment of action should we intervene or not, um, and again I think what care ethics does is it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem of when there is an immediate humanitarian crisis that we have to make a decision and I've had discussions with colleagues about this. Um, but on the other hand, I think there is something to be said for paying more attention to the permanent background to these crises, right? So uh, again, when, that doesn't help us. We can't go back in time. Um, but if we were more attentive to, um, to you know, the, the way in which care is, is, is um, is made possible um, in different contexts, then these crises may not have may not emerge, you know, in the first place. Um, that said, you know, there are, and I'm sure that people are have seen things around here. Tom, Thomas Weiss, uh, responsibility, yeah, 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 responsibility. Yeah, so the, the R2P, the responsibility to protect, I think that document tries to do that kind of thing by talking about responsibility to prevent, responsibility to protect, protect and what is it now? And after, I'm too tired. Yeah, and then after. Um, so, so again, trying to get away from just that moment, but if you read the document carefully, it really does actually all kind of come back to, well, we are going to have these crises and we're going to need to intervene and we're going to need to intervene militarily uh, to, to solve them. So, so I, I can't give you an answer right now of what a kind of um, care-sensitive humanitarian intervention would look like. Um, I, can't, I can't map that out in my mind. Um, but I think there's been too much attention on when should we intervene and when shouldn't we, and not enough attention to the, to the background to those crises. That seems very sensible, but I want to just push it a little further because um, a lot of the real problems are, you know, transnational and between groups, and not just within them, yeah. right? Yeah. Ethnic conflicts and 
poverty, global poverty, with the the way that you know whether or not Thomas Pogge is correct mm -hmm. about it. But you know, mm -hmm. obviously, Western countries have a lot of of a role, as well as global corporations have a big role in generating global poverty. So, how do you see care a care ethics approach addressing these? not just the background conditions, but some of these core conflicts and interactive uh, issues uh, across borders um, that seem difficult to resolve. I can see that a, a general emphasis on background conditions, as with a general emphasis on economic and social rights and well-being and the development of institutions would be very helpful even to counter terrorism and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. is that all you can say? Or is there something more that it could actually bring to the lack of care, say, between groups? Is there some way to address that? Or the lack of care that Western people and co global corporations show to the ones that work for, for them and the, the suppliers and so forth? How would that work? <laughs> Yeah, I, I again, I don't, I don't know if I really have an answer to that, and I, I'm reluctant to say that we should just kind of try and get ethnic groups to care more about one another. No, obviously, but yeah, that yeah, seems overly so simple. But yeah. what could you say? Well, um, uh, I don't know. Um, I think that you know, if you if you think about care on a variety of different levels, and and think about those levels as not totally isolated from one another, right? That, that if you have families, communities, societies, nation states, care has to, uh, you know, exist on all those different levels. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that there, there's, there are ways to think about, you know, cross-cutting relations of care and, and networks of care. Um, I don't know, and maybe you have some better well, Just, you know, some of the work uh, like Laura Seelberg and others yeah. who try to use power with notions of collaboration and democracy and that form of more collaboration. Yeah. Uh, have, they've applied it to just war theory in interesting ways. And yeah, like empathetic cooperation. Yeah, and ways of yeah. projecting that and transforming democracy so that it takes care into account. I mean, there are ways to, yeah. to use the concept. I was just wondering if you had thoughts about it. Maybe. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think... And that kind of the book? For me, no, maybe. <laughs> Every time I write another thing on care, I say, this is the last thing I'm going to write on care. But then I, then I just write another one. Yeah. Um, I, I, in terms of Poget, you know, thinking about this kind of structural um, inequalities that are embedded in the global economy, again, you know, I seem to be agreeing with a lot of people, but I, when I read his book, I... I fundamentally agree with what a lot of what he's saying. I just think it's just it's just not enough. I mean, if you go to the back of that book, to the index, you know, there's gender isn't in the, it's not in the index. And I think that how can you think about poverty and, well, maybe he doesn't use the term security, but, you know, people's well-being without thinking about gender relations, it seems to me so fundamental. Um, now that gender doesn't equal care, but it's but gender and the uneven distribution of care, both the receiving of care and the giving of care, you know, it seems to me crucial to to how people experience poverty, um, and also to understanding what is you know masculinity and femininity and how those that kind of cultural sexism plays it is cross-cutting across just what happens at the IMF and the World Bank. You know, that's only one level of it. Um, so, so again, I don't know if you can apply care ethics to, to the IMF, um, but you can certainly bring it in in other ways um, and, and remind us all all the time that, um, that that experiencing insecurity is not just what happens at the WTO. Uh, well, I think we should show some care to the members of the audience and, and feed you. <laughs> Go to the basics here. So we have all kinds of treats down on the fifth floor, and Fiona Robinson will be available for informal conversation where you can follow up. Thank you. Thank you so much.